The account of David versus Goliath is arguably one of the most popular narratives found within God's Word. Most people with minimal Bible knowledge can tell something about the future king of Israel and his fight with that giant. Many can recall the days of vacation Bible school and or other Bible classes when the account of David and Goliath was told. Even the world uses the term David and Goliath as a metaphor. We hear it a lot when it comes to sports, when an underdog is facing a team that could not, quote, possibly be defeated. Our minds wandered at such an account that had it not been found within the Bible, we may have thought it untrue. As we get older, our studies may turn to other subjects with more substance, and our days of reading about David and Goliath are few in number. Today, we're going to search the Scriptures and discuss David and his encounter with Goliath. So let's get out our Bibles, go to 1 Samuel in chapter 17, and let's prepare to open our hearts and minds. But first, let us sing the following songs of praise. Yeah.
Searching the Scriptures is brought to you by the Fairview Church of Christ. We believe that the Holy Bible is inspired by God and is the only way how He speaks to us today. In this great book, we are told how to be saved and live a holy life. It is our hope and prayer that you are encouraged to study with us at this time, open your hearts and minds to the great words of God, and follow them. Hello and thank you for joining me for another episode of Searching the Scriptures where we take the time to examine the most important book in our lives, the all-inspired Word of God. I'm Brandon Greaves, preacher for the Fairview Church of Christ located at 1765 Industrial Loop Road in Pulaski, Tennessee. David was the youngest of eight sons born to Jesse. David's three eldest brothers, Eliab, Abinadab and Shammah were enlisted in the army of Saul and were soon engaged in battle with the Philistines. David was then sent by his father with food for his brothers and others, but he had no intentions to be in front of that battle. While there, David witnessed the giant Goliath, a man that was more than nine feet tall, defy the army of Israel and demand that a man be sent to fight him. He also witnessed the unfaithfulness of all those around him. After some persuading, David was allowed to go down and fight that giant. He was called to be the champion, literally the middleman of the Israelites, which was a task that no man around him was willing to accomplish. You know the story. Five smooth stones were chosen to go into the skilled shepherd's sling, but only one would be necessary. The chosen champion loaded that first stone in the sling and skillfully hurled it into the giant's forehead. Goliath immediately fell to the ground in defeat. David won neither with a sword or shield, but with a mere sling shepherd staff, and stones. And the question is, how did David do the unthinkable? Well, today, for just a pre brief period, I would like for us to visit that very familiar narrative and look at some characteristics of David with the aim to make us think about our own faith. First, let's discuss David's passion. When David heard Goliath's words, Righteous resentment was built inside. David could not allow an uncircumcised Philistine to defy the armies of the living God, verse 26. The Israelite armies turned into groups of cowards when they heard the words of Goliath taunting them morning and night for 40 days, verses 11, 16, and 24. But David took Goliath's words as a threat to the God of Israel. He could not just stand there and, and let the heathen rage upon God's chosen people. David had spiritual anger, righteous indignation. Jesus showed this same kind of passion. John 2, 14 and 15 says, and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. He casted out those who sold the animals for sacrificial purposes. They had, they had not been dealing fairly with the people to whom they were selling. And their hearts were more interested in making a profit. We live in a world that's no different. The existence of God is questioned. Christians are falsely represented by those who falsely claim to be Christians. Immoral agendas are constantly being forced in all forms of media. Well, Paul wrote, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, Ephesians 4 and 26. And this is not an exhortation to be angry without a cause. 
Now, this is anger that is directed towards sin and error. This anger is controlled by the gospel. We must despise evil and love that which is good, Romans 12 and 9. This kind of passion will lead us to always do that which is right. Hate sinful practices and be disgusted by them. Love that which is good and desire to do it always. Next, David had personal ambition. David's spiritual outrage was his main motivation to fight against Goliath, but he showed interest in the personal benefits that were offered to the man who killed the giant. Read with me verses 25 through 27. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. The one who killed the giant would be rich, marry the king's daughter, and his father's house would be tax-free. <laughs> wouldn't that be nice, wouldn't it? David was a young man, but he was old enough to make vitally important decisions for himself. He developed a deeply rooted faith and trusted in God. Therefore, he's spiritually strong enough to confidently approach Goliath. And David, he didn't gamble his life in this battle. No, he didn't think, I might lose my life, but King Saul's reward is worth the risk. Friends, he knew that God was on his side. He knew that the battle belongs to the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Is God on your side? Are you on His side? And if so, what's hindering you to face your giant? If God is on your side, the outcome on this earth makes no difference. The victory is already won. So make your plans big. Now that we've discussed David's passion, Let's discuss David's past. David faced previous trials. King Saul received word that David was willing to be Israel's champion and the king sent for David. Saul questions David's ability because of his lack of experience. Well, let's read verse 33 with me. Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David answers by reflecting on his past. Let's read through 36. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. <laughs> David was telling the king that he was not as inexperienced as he thought. Who did David give credit well, let's look at verse 37. David said, Moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. So David was confident that God would deliver him from 
Goliath, just as he delivered, delivered him from the paws of the lion and the bear. And notice that David did not try to hide from Saul the fact that he was a shepherd. Instead of finding shame in his lowly occupation, David used his previous experiences to help him learn to face the future. The experiences from David's past are now motivating him to face the giant Goliath. How many young people today would do well to learn from their past decisions, whether, they're, whether they be good or bad? There's no doubt that David's past inspired him toward a greater trust and reliance upon God. Such can be the same with every person, whether young or old. Paul seemed to believe in the power of learning from the past. This is what he said, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope, Romans 15 and 4. Whatever we do in life, we can better ourselves by learning from previous mistakes and or previous moments of righteousness to inspire faith, trust, and obedience for the future. Friends, experience is the only way to grow. There are those who do not attempt to serve, well, because of fear. How do we overcome these fears? <laughs> by just deciding that, hey, I'm going to do this, and it'll get easier. James wrote this, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. James 1, 2-4 To strengthen our faith, we have to experience trials. If you want to be a better athlete, if you want to be a better artist, or whatever, Practice and master the necessary skills. If you want to be a better servant of the Lord, friends, we have to get up and practice those things which are necessary to serve Him. The reward is far greater. Now that we've discussed David's passion and past, let's take the time to discuss David's proficiencies. David used his own skills to accomplish this great task. I truly believe that the power of providence guided David through his previous experiences to get him to the point where he could face Goliath confidently. However, we must not dismiss David's own skills which helped him to win the fight. Read with me verses 38 and 39. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put on... He put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. Rather than accepting Saul's armor, which is more proof of David's faith, David chose to fight the best way he knew how, with a sling and stones. He mastered the art of fighting with the sling. It could be possible that David was as skilled in the use of the sling as were the Benjamites who could sling at a hair's breadth and not miss, Judges 20 and 16. Christians today must not discount their own talents and abilities when yielding service to God. Individuals are designed to be different. We have different personalities, we have different preferences, and different potential. But everyone can do something in service to God. David's example shows that one does not have to aim at what might be considered the quote, highest mark to serve God. Many may have viewed the opportunity of wearing Saul's personal armor as a coveted armor, but such armor would have done David no good. Serve God in the best way you can and to the best of your ability. The main thing is that you serve God. Finally, let's discuss David's priorities. 
first he gave God the glory. Despite his skill and ability, David took no credit for himself, but attributed his success and previous triumphs to God. This glory was due to God, who gave to David all of his great talents. Even as he faced Goliath, the Israelite champion gave the glory to God. Read with me verses 45 through 47. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. <laughs> wow. David, through the glorification of God, showed that all the world should know that there is one true living God, and that God is the one who saves. Not the sword, spear, or any other instrument of man. He said, For I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me, but thou has saved us from our enemies and has put them to shame that hated us. Psalm 44, 6 and 7. Christians may do all sorts of great things, but they are to give the glory to their deserving Father. Paul said he had nothing in which to glory, for necessity is laid upon me. 1 Corinthians 9 and 16. Second, David was obedient. When commanded by his father Jesse to go to the battlefield to see his brothers, David not only obeyed, but rose up early in the morning and went as Jesse had commanded him. Verse 20. David eagerly obeyed his father and proved by his obedience that he was properly qualified to handle great responsibility. In the parable of the talents, Jesus said, Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Matthew 25. Those who show proper submission to the Master are those who are qualified for the honor and privilege of service in the Lord's kingdom. A great honor. Third, David suffered persecution. His own brother rebuked him for setting foot on the battlefield, even though David was there on orders from Jesse, verses 20 through 30. This youngest brother handled the persecution with incredible patience and excellent resolution. He had right and reason on his side and knew it, and therefore did not render railing for railing, 1 Peter 3 and 9. Additionally, Goliath persecuted David as they faced each other in battle. David looked to God for strength to see him through the persecution to the ultimate victory. Finally, David showed confidence. David stood before Goliath with an outstanding faith in God which made him confident in the victory. Verse 48 says, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David did not cower in fear in the heat of the moment. He confidently hasted and ran. He knew that he was anointed of God. Therefore, nothing was going to happen to him. God was on his side, and David was on God's side. When we know the outcome, we can be confident. Friends, Goliath had no chance. Five smooth stones were placed into that shepherd's 
bag as the Israelite champion skillfully used his weapon. David was young, but he did not let his age stand in the way of fulfilling an important role in service to God. What stands between young people today and faithful, dedicated service to the Master? Why are congregations not filled with modern-day Davids who confidently and victoriously combat Satan? Friends, there is no excuse. David is an excellent Old Testament example of this New Testament concept. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. 1 Timothy 4 and 12. When God is on our side and when we are on His side, our Goliaths have no chance. <laughs> Today is the day of salvation. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14 and 15. And if you love him and are grateful for what he has done, then do what he says because we're told that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation for everyone who obeys him, Hebrews 5 and 9. When we read God's Word, we can know what to do in order to please Him. We're taught that obedient faith, which includes repentance, Acts 17.30, confession of Christ, Romans 10.9 and 10, baptism for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38, Acts 22 and 16, and continued faith unto the end, Revelation 2.10, will save us. Isn't it wonderful that we know by reading this God-breathed book that we can know about the works that He wants us to do in order to please Him and choose to do them. It's an easy decision to make, isn't it? <laughs> he loves and provides all that we need physically and spiritually. And we can know that if we've obeyed His commandments given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit written in this book, we can have an eternal home with Him. Thank you once again for studying the truth of God's Word with me and may God go with you through the week and may you forever be mindful of what is really important as you live day by day. I'm Brandon Greaves, the preacher for the Fairview Church of Christ in Pulaski, Tennessee. And I wish to invite you to study with me next time for another presentation of Searching the Scriptures. The members of the Fairview congregation desire to bring glory to God. We do this by living our lives to the best of our ability according to His Word, serving others who are in need, and spreading the gospel throughout the community and the world. The members at Fairview want to extend to you an invitation to visit with us. We hope to see you this morning for Bible study at 10 a.m. and worship at 11 a.m. Your presence will honor and encourage us.